get a sticky note slid in over in between us is Casey and then to the right is Dan Fleischman. And so he slides a sticky note saying to me, need video, no editing, just film. I've never told him this. I only had a boom mic. When you have someone on stage, you want an auxiliary right beneath their shirt. There was a couple other content creators I had met. Someone just asked me, he's last minute, he's a speaker. You want to go up there, can I borrow your audio equipment? How do you do things that set you apart? His request was to only document and then send the raw content to his video editor. Thing that follows after this, it was just from that moment. Welcome to the Brad Dog Media Show with your host, Katie Hester. What's going on, guys? Brady Hester here, host of the Brad Dog Media Show. I bet you wonder how you can go from living a normal life to creating content for Evander Holyfield, Casey Adams, Steve Ioki, Patrick Mahomes. The names go on and on with this guy. And his name is Roger Rojas, the content CEO. He's a guy that's absolutely blowing up over the past couple of years. But it's been super interesting to speak with him and learn about his journey. And it's not like he just bursted on the scene out of nowhere. There's so much hard work, dedication, willingness to say yes to get to the opportunities he's getting today. We'll learn about the power of networking. He managed to meet some of the biggest names. Roger went from some of the more typical projects to ranking up and now working with some of the biggest names that you see on social media. I know you'll learn a ton from this interview. I learned a lot getting to speak with him. And if you're enjoying the show, please leave a like, a comment, and I would really appreciate your subscription. I have more big guests on the way and I don't want you to miss future episodes. Enough from me, welcome to the show. Today, I am joined by a legend behind the camera. He has worked with Steve Aoki, Evander Holyfield, Dan Fleischman, Grant Cardone, Casey Adams, and everybody in Kansas City, Patrick Mahomes, and he's worked with much, much more. He is the content CEO. Roger Rojas. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate you uh, doing this and that intro was awesome. <laughs> Glad you like it, man. I mean, it's easy to make a, a sick intro for you. You have like, man, so many cool people you've worked with. Like what's, what's it been like the past couple of years getting like involved with all these people? Like I just saw you're in Steve Aoki's house the other day. I mean, is that just crazy or what? Yeah, I would say the biggest thing for me is when I first started, I just wanted to create content. You know, I wasn't, I didn't think about more so who I was doing it for. I just wanted to do it. And right. I was so privileged and thankful enough to do it for someone who believed in me before I believed in myself. And uh, that person is Frankie Dagg. He's, he was my first ever person that believed in me again and someone who entrusted me to build out content for his fitness facility that he co-owned at the time. Wow. And so then as evolution happened, right, of uh, just continuously saying yes to endless projects and traveling wherever I needed to go or, or wherever they wanted me to be, um, I got to meet all these special characters that, you know, people, like they have their own following of such. But uh, truthfully, when I do what I do, I just go into it thinking to myself, like, I'm here for a service. How do I execute on that? And then how do I do so well that they're going to want me to come back again? Um, so even though the people yeah. change, and even though there's like that social uh, currency of the attention that these people have, I really don't think about that. I think about why am I there and how could I do such a great job that they're going to want me to come back. So that's my mindset with, yeah. with I work with. Wow. Yeah, that's great to hear. And, and, you know, it makes total sense because your work is so amazing. It's not like you're there just to socialize. And of course, people see all these pictures with you behind the scenes with all these big names, but um that's great to hear, you know, you're so professional about it and it really is about the craft. How long have you been into uh, creating content and, and work behind the camera? So it started about 2020. So yeah, it started about the summer of 2015, going into my senior year of college. I worked, I had a Gatorade internship. So that involved me wow. going up the East Coast and we stopped in every major city, educating high school students on the importance of hydration by marketing Gatorade products. And by doing so, we had to create a market report um, that involved videos and photos, mostly photos. Um, and my friend, who was the photographer, um, and I was a, 
part of it through him. He would just give me the camera while he was speaking to the students. He'd be like, yo, just take a couple shots. Um, I had no idea what I was doing. I had no idea what the camera settings were. Um, I was just pressing the button and telling me to press. And uh, there was a couple times where I took a couple photos where I thought to myself, wow, I did that. I was able to capture that moment. And it was kind of the aha moment. So then going back to Miami, which is where I'm born and raised, um, I had a good family friend who has a professional drone company and a part of his team, he had a full-time photographer. So I reached out to him and I said to him, hey, you know, I just spent the past summer working for Gatorade, taking photos. I don't know what I want to do, but I enjoyed it. Would I be able to shadow you or your photographer for the day? He immediately said yes. Uh, we coordinated the day, spent the whole day with this photographer. By the end of the day, when he was driving me home, he told me to look in the back seat and there was a full camera set up. And it was a camera that they weren't using anymore. That was kind of in, just in storage. Um, and he had one contingency for it. He's like, you could have this camera for free, but I just need you to go out there and create. <laughs> and so what I did, I went uh, at that time, I was finishing my senior year at Iona College, a private Catholic school up in New Rochelle, New York. And I, I just did that. You know, I started off with my fraternity, Pi Kappa Phi. I made the first recruitment video, uh, you know, and then from there it was just sorority videos. And then I picked up kind of steam into a local business. And then it's just that snowball effect of fundraisers and doing all these little projects that involved video. Um, to help anyone and everyone I could at my school. Wow. That's a really cool story, man. So you didn't even go into college having any videography type interests. It's just something that kind of caught your attention and that excitement of capturing something that, that got a hold of you. Right. And I think not to neglect, I have always had interest in, I guess, the, the content side of things, you know, where uh, I wasn't deeply um, into Instagram, but I would just randomly take pictures. So I didn't own a camera before. Um, I didn't have a true understanding of it. My best friend became YouTube. And for anyone listening that's telling themselves, and I, I really try to share this and talk about this as much as I can, is that all these people that I work with that have a lot of social attention is great. Um, you know, I, for me, that makes me feel good because that means what I'm doing is servicing everyone and that's getting the attention of everyone. So that's cool. Uh, but in reality, I want to break this down and foundation and tell yourself any creative that sounds like, how can I start today? You don't have to buy a course. You don't have to buy a big camera. I did everything through YouTube. Every time I had a question of what is this? How do you do this? I always YouTube did. I didn't buy a course. I didn't, you know, I didn't have a mentor at the time. There, I didn't have any of that. I just YouTube did or Google did. Um, and when it came to the camera, how do you pick one, right? Everyone says there's so many. So having, there's an abundance of it. How do you pick the one? I just started off with my phone and then I was given one and I made the best of it for, I used that same camera for a year and a half. Uh, when, for my first job that I got paid to like weddings, you know? Wow. And people again, always say to themselves, I don't have this, I don't have that. I never thought of that. I just worked with what I had. And then the time came, of course, you set certain budgets aside to add on to your equipment because it does become expensive. So I, I just had to share that because that's so important of just starting and taking whatever you have and making something of it. And you don't have to spend thousands or hundreds of dollars. You could just use what's in front of you or the resources that you have. Yeah, that's a great point. And I mean, I would encourage that to anybody, you know, and anything they do. I think a lot of people get intimidated by not having the proper equipment and comparing themselves to the, you know, big professionals that, Right. have thousands of dollars worth of equipment and that might keep them from starting, but you know, use what you got and just get rolling. Right. Right. And, and that's so important because we all go through that. Like I still have, I remove the fear with inspiration. So what I tell myself is I may want this camera or I may want this accessory for my camera that will further my creative craft. And that's good and that's great. So you just set goals to achieve that or to purchase that item. You know, I used to think to myself, I'm never gonna have them. Oh, this is 3,000, this is 5,000. Soon before you know the five things I want, I'm like 12,000 deep. <laughs> and, and anyone, you know, you can't just, you could of course swipe out a card and make it happen. But the idea is like you slowly build towards that. You don't have to look at the top, you know, just start, you know, chipping at it, just chip at it slowly by each equipment, slowly one by one. And then ultimately you'll have all the things that, uh, you inspired to have through a period of time of putting in the work and setting the goal of how can I 
manifest this towards hitting that? You know, how many jobs does X take to purchase X equipment? You know, outlining and game planning. I'd say that was the biggest thing for me is where, how do I get where I want to go is just creating the plan. And then once you create the plan, the hardest part is execution, but it's the fact of doing it over and over and over again. Yeah, you're spot on, man. And so going back to your career, I'm super interested in how, you know, you start with fraternities. I'm interested in hearing the progression between that and then making your way out to California and, you know, starting to get involved with, you know, the celebrities and the big names. What was that transition like? And how did that, you know, all unfold? Yeah, great question. So for me, I, because of my relationship, uh, my little brother of the fraternity was the president at the time. And, you know, when you have that kind of intimate relationship, how can you have his presence be known or strong? And I had the camera and I had a word to pull to where I was like, all right, I need to create content. And I had asked him, I was like, hey, can we make a video? He said, of course. So I outlined it, storyboarded it, filmed it, shot it, edited it, put it out there, uh, not knowing the positive kind of reaction my school would give. Because at that time, the other, my school is a small private Catholic school. And most of the other people, we only have two other fraternities that, I guess, compete with us, right? And at the time, everyone was just doing photo slideshows. And so I had no level of kind of expectation mixed with idea of how people would kind of receive the video or take it. And it went really well. And it, that helped with my confidence and then furthering my arm to clubs or activities or anything happening on the college campus to create it. And when after I graduated, I had a very, very interesting moment in my life where I bet on myself. And I'll tell you truthfully, I didn't even feel that confident on it. So for me, I was born and raised in Miami and I transitioned to New York at 18 and I'm one of five and I was the first one to leave my house. Wow. And you know, my family wasn't very receptive into me going into New York, but later on after the four years, I made them the best four years of my life where I made sure of every activity I did it, every type of service trip I did it, every type of experience I had gone but ultimately, as a family, what do they want when you graduate college? They want you to have a job opportunity. And I knew that when May came around in 2016, if I didn't have something lined up, I felt I would have failed. Not only failed myself, but more so my family with the expectation of taking that leap from Florida to New York and then ending up back in Miami uh, to just do whatever I don't know would have ended up doing. Right. <laughs> and needless to say, there's nothing wrong with going home. But again, this was a personal kind of goal where I wanted to make myself something and known and have that kind of, uh, I guess, uh, that step up to my family. Hey, I did this and this is what I've done and uh, this is where I'm going. And so just to get to the point of it, uh, my best friend, Frankie Dagg, who I referred to earlier, he was opening up a fitness facility. And through that short four or five month period of my senior year towards the end, he was paying me to go to the gym and document it as it was being opened. And he said to me, hey, I love what you do, how you do it. Um, I believe in what you're doing. Um, I can't offer you a full-time salary job, but I could offer you one-off projects and help you further your company and extension towards more business. So to help you make more money. And I said to him at first, I was unsure. He helped me figure things out. A friend of a friend, soon before you know it, I move into a basement of a house nearby. Um, and then I go all in on just helping him with marketing at the gym and then him introducing to every single person that walked through that door. So the beauty behind a fitness facility is that everyone comes from all different work walks of life and everyone right. has a business or someone that knows of someone with the business. And he was my ultimate hype man. He literally every single person that came through that door, he was like, you need photos, you need videos, you need photos, you need videos for your website, for Google, for social media. He's like, you need it. And, you know, he continuously did that over and over. I said, again, yes to everything you could think of from camps, from basketball to soccer, to dance academies, to baptisms, to weddings, um, you name it. And I've shot it, food products, restaurants. And did I know what I was doing 90% of the time? No. Uh, did I have a positive attitude and outlook? on getting done what needed to be done? Yes. Did I use Google and YouTube and other resources to prepare me to get into that? Yes. But ultimately, 
the evolution came when um, I felt that I needed to do more. And I was in Westchester County, which is about 20 minutes north of New York City, give or take. And I then started traveling into the city more often, which I knew with anything else to further your network, you got to further your reach. And how do you do that? By placing yourself there. And I then started just through friendships, going to different events, covering different events, um, anything, again, same topics uh, that I referred to it before. Whatever put me into a room with different people, I said yes to it, as long as it involved video and photo documenting of some sort. And that trial just over and over and over and over again uh, created my network, uh, which I'm so grateful to have now. And I'm continuously trying to extend that, but more so connect with the right people and for me, my niche uh, that was very consistent aside from everything else was fitness. Because yeah. I believe in the fitness space, three things happen. One, uh, you're aligned with like-minded people. For someone to show up and ready to sweat and just kind of get after it for 60, 45 minutes, you got to have some form of a mindset to like be an overachiever or a hard worker. And those are qualities that I love. And the second thing was, is that when you go into these, let's say, group fitness settings, people are more enticed to have conversations with you rather than it being a private session, you know? Um, and me being the social butterfly that I am, I talk to everyone as much as I can or I try to meet someone or connect someone as much as I can. And so those two things are the greatest thing. But the third thing for me that I love the most about kind of the fitness niche is that everyone is always trying to be better. Like that saying of what more can I do? How can I be better? How can I, you know, take that extra rep? <clears throat> How can I further my self-improvement? And for me, that's, I think that's life. That's ever, evergreen. Like you need to continuously have that mindset of like, what more can I do? How further can I get in life? And who are the people that I'm doing it with? Right. And so that turned into, you know, the past Four, yeah, three and a half, four years of post-grad life went from small businesses to athletes. You know, I was hired through a good friend of mine who was the training session, who was the, I think the actual term was, um, he, he just worked on everything from the fitness room to stretching um, with guys that were first on draft picks with X, XL Sports Management. So that's a sports oh, management yeah. company. Um, yeah. And so for back-to-back -back summers, I would go in there with him and document these first round draft picks. And so I got the athlete feel of things. Um, and then it later turned into, as you referred to someone else who I've worked with is Casey Adams. So he's someone that I started, you know, I went to an entrepreneurship event with Eric Thomas and Gerard Adams uh, because another client and friend of mine, Brian Mazza was leading a private VIP workout, which Casey was attending. Uh, he then meets my friend Frank, who's at the event. And he let him know that in a week or so, he was returning to meet Gary Vaynerchuk. And for those who don't know, he's an entrepreneur, speaker, author, New York Times bestselling author, and then the founder of Vayner X. Um, oh, yeah. This, then, this crowd know, knows. <laughs> great, great, yeah. And so he said he was going in the next week and he needed a video guy. He immediately turned to me and said, this is your guy. Um, we spent the day shooting, um, you know, from Gary Vee's office to running around the city itself. And then that later turned into a relationship that I never thought would have evolved into what it did, where we essentially would travel across the country. Um, we would be in the same cities at the same time. He would be speaking at certain events and I would be there to document him. And again, this goes into the same thing of what I did with the fitness uh, kind of uh, niche of placing myself in environments that I wanted to be in. So I was attending all these various entrepreneurship conferences, uh, but at the same time networking and furthering my relationships with certain people that I wanted to grow with and one of them being Casey and one time we I ended up in Tampa Florida with him and this kind of leads into the next person who played such a vital role in my growth over the past 16 months or I would even, yeah over the past 16 months it was an event called Social X um, it was put together by now one of my good friends Justin Cavaliero um, and another Aaron Platt and so they similar again, entrepreneurship type conference where the United speakers and they would have people come and give insight on their various specialty. Casey was there. He asked me to come by. I documented him. I'm sitting at a table and I got a sticky note slidden over in between us is Casey and then to the right is Dan Fleischman. Um, and at that point, at that point I, did, I had known of Dan through a prior event, but I've never had a personal conversation. And so he slides a sticky note saying to me, need video, no editing, just film. I said, sure. 
I look at him I said, per, and then he had like an asterisk. He's like paid. I would have done it for free to be honest, but you know, thankfully enough, he was like paid. And so I, yeah. I then, this is also an apparent lesson. I, I've never told him this. So at that moment, I only had a boom mic. And for those content creators, you know, as a speaker, when you have someone on stage, you want an auxiliary right beneath their shirts, you get the highest quality audio. And considering the person of who it was, I needed that. I immediately go to the back of the conference. There was a couple other content creators I had met just a few minutes before. I said to him, hey man, um, someone just asked me, he's last minute, he's a speaker. He wants to go up there. Can I borrow your audio equipment just for this one talk? And I'll give it right back to you. I'll Venmo you money, whatever you need. It, he looks at me and says, don't even worry about it. Helps me set it up. I've never set up this equipment before in my life. Was I nervous? Yup. But I still put it on my <laughs> camera. I said to him, I was like, which one goes to him? He gives it to me, the transmitter. Boom, boom, audio. I set him up. I film him. And this is what I believe kind of, how do you do things that set you apart? And so in that moment, when I, he went up there, gave his 30, 45 minute speech, it was his request was to only document and then send the raw content to his video editor. And he gave me his email. I then told myself, how do I separate myself from probably any other person that he's ever asked to do this for? Mm. I immediately go upstairs to my room, uh, watch the 30, 45 minutes, pick a minute segment and create a piece of content for him to post within an hour of him getting off the stage. Wow. I did that. I send it to him. I asked Casey for his personal number to get it directly to him versus it being maybe lost in his email and him seeing it in 48 hours, right? My statement was how fast can I turn it around to then, you know, for him not to forget me. And yeah, I did that. He was so surprised. He loved the piece of content. He posted content um, for those thinking like, all right, that's great, man. Like, you know, what does that mean for you? Like, what was the end thought process? Truthfully, it was just, how do I make a statement? You know, it wasn't about, it wasn't about the content. It was just more so how do I make sure this guy doesn't forget me for what I did? And so I was able to turn it around. And I bring this story into context because everything that follows after this, it, it was just from that moment, I believe that I set myself up to do something that would further my thought on what would happen next. 48 hours pass. I'm at the airport now with Casey and we're actually headed uh, to Arizona with him. I'm headed with him to Arizona and he puts, I get a, a friend request from an individual on Instagram uh, named Charlie walk. And so he sends me a, a DM saying, Hey bro, call me. I have no idea who this person is. Uh, his bio was empty at the time. Um, he had just like got into Instagram again and he was verified. So the, obviously the blue check mark kind of got my attention. I was like, who is this person? Um, but I didn't respond. Um, within a few minutes later, I'm in a group chat with Dan and this general, I just referred to Charlie walk. Dan says, Hey Raj, Charlie is filming an online course. He, he needs someone. And I told him you're the guy. Wow. So I said, wow. Okay. Sure. So I immediately respond saying, Hey Dan, thank you for the intro and the kind words, Charlie, feel free to give me a call whenever you're available. I wasn't even done texting that. I maybe sent it. And within five seconds, Charlie calls me. Charlie calls me and let me know that he was an executive producer. Or wait, I'm sorry. He doesn't tell me that. He then tells me what he's trying to achieve, which is an online music course. Um, he's been in the music business for a good amount of time. but doesn't tell me how long, nor does he tell me his background. And so I then tell him, sure, you know, I'm more than gladly to outline a proposal and put something together and send it to him. He then tells me to do this and this for those who hear this at first maybe like wow this guy's arrogant or wow this is like an aggressive term but once you get to know him this is who he is and you get to learn to love him for what he is he says to me i don't think you know the level of type of content that i need i need you to hang up the phone and google me and i said got it i'm gonna hang up and google you so then I hang up the phone, I Google him, and then I end up finding out he was a president of a major record label. Um, and he's behind the signing of most artists that we listen to on the radio today that range from Post Malone, Shawn Mendes, he put Destiny's Child together. Um, the list can go on and on, helped out with Will Smith, Beyonce, The Weeknd, like everybody. Crazy. One of brothers, everybody, like music revolved around him. He is known as the artist behind the artist. And so then I call him and I'm like, all right, I get it. I think you got a couple good eyeballs on here. And uh, we coordinate a date. 
and soon before you know it, um, I'm in Brooklyn, New York shooting. He then transitions from me shooting the whole thing, the whole thing to just shooting behind the scenes. Um, and I cultivate that relationship. I executed on that. And a few short weeks later, Dan puts me in another group chat with someone that I have no idea who it is. And he says to me, he says to me, Hey, Hey, Justin, uh, this is your guy for the week that you're in New York. He'll be able to take care of where you need to take care of. So I immediately respond, having no idea who it is saying, I got you, uh, you know, in, in short, I said, hello, Justin, you know, uh, love, can't wait to work with you. Let me know what you need and how I can help you. So then he kind of outlines what they need. Um, I end up showing up to a hotel room with cameras and things going on. And again, based off the first thing I said at the beginning of the interview, I believe has allowed me to kind of have that mellow mindset of why am I there? What am I supposed to be doing? And how do I execute on that without getting caught up in the hype of the individual? Right? Because you could right. easily do that where you, because of the person that you may be documenting, you could get the jitters, you could be extra nervous, or you could say something you don't want to say. How do I remove that is by simply showing up and being me, but also doubling down on executing on why I'm there. You know, I'm not there to talk to them the whole time, even though I do believe in having conversation with your client is important because you, you're a person, but you're there to film, you're there to take photos, and I want to make sure I do that well. And so I didn't Google or look up the person I was meeting up with. And so I'm there. She's the woman. Justin was the fiance. The woman, I was there for his fiance. She's getting powdered up soon before, you know, Forbes is there um, doing an interview. So I'm shooting behind the scenes. Um, she then later tells me we're going to a conference. I was canceled due to the heat in New York City, but it was going to be with A-Rod and J-Lo who were meeting up for lunch. And so I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, this, like, you know, who is this lady, you know, like, who, who is this that she kind of has all this attention, you know, and this hype right now with, you know, who we're meeting up with the association, right? And during the Forbes interview, the, the woman looks and I had that moment where she looks at her and she says, uh, Cindy, you know, how did it feel to sell your company for a billion dollars? And I was behind the camera. And I swear to you, I did one of these where I had it listened in with the audio. I was like, you know, I kind of had a moment like, oh, snap, like that's pretty boss, you know? Man. Um, she ends up being Cindy Eckert. She created for, uh, Sprout Pharmaceuticals, creating the female Viagra, selling it for a billion dollars. That's amazing. Yeah. And I had no idea who she was. And into context of those listening, they're like, you know, that's not very smart of you to go into a shoot with not knowing or identifying who your person is. And the reason I didn't do that is because of the association of who put me in contact with them. Um, I met them through Dan. And so at that point, I understand the caliber of person, who he is and who he associates himself with. So I had no issues or doubt of where I was going or who I was going to be documenting it being an issue or more so being someone that um, was out of my understanding of what they could do. Because again, I was there to just film, take videos, take photos, make the cool content for them to right. share for platforms, you know? Um, and, and I share those two stories or three between Dan, Charlie and Cindy, um, because I want people to know that, yes, again, they, they may have the attention of the world, but ultimately they're in need of content. And I believe what separates me from every other content person is the approach with the content, making sure it's delivered in a timely manner, but also being a person and being present. So I do, I do refer to kind of being there and making sure I do what needs to be done. But then it's also having the moments of being a person and talking to them like a person and not getting caught up with thinking too much on what you say or how you say it. Um, and I just love people and I love having conversations and I love asking questions. So if I'm in a room with someone who's done certain things in business and I have the opportunity to ask them a question, I'm asking them a question. Like I have no, I don't hold back, even though it may be a simple question or people may see it as a dumb question. It's my question. I don't know the answer to it. And if there's an individual in front of me that's achieved certain things that I aspire to do, then I'm going to ask them that. Totally. Man, that's crazy. What an awesome story. Have you told that before anywhere? Uh, I, I, I can't, I don't think so. The Dan story, because I've, I've had personal conversations with people about it. Um, and then they kind of like, I, every time at the last one recently was actually Casey Adams girlfriend. She was like, kind of like, how did you guys meet? 
and Casey's story, we ended up, I ended up traveling like four different States with him. And like, after showing up to Tampa, like immediately after three different States, it was like insanity. But uh, I think the baseline of that was just simply like, I'm putting myself in the right rooms with the right people to do things that I think are cool or fun, which happens to be in the business and entrepreneurship space. Totally. And it kind of goes back to what you were talking about earlier, saying yes to all of those projects. I mean, how many right. different projects did you run through saying yes, yes, yes. But, you know, it didn't necessarily amount to anything crazy, but you just need that right. one. And then you got that one. Right. Yeah. I think I've never officially ever counted my work to say like I've created X amount of videos or I've done X amount of shoots because my mentality with this, especially with the world we live in is like document edit, distribute, repeat. Um, because after a, week, after a day, after two days, the world we live in is constantly being stimulated by so many different things that if you slow down for too long, you may not, you know, it may not be relevant, right? Um, and I think a perfect example of that is, let's just say in context of basketball, I love basketball. Um, if I started putting out content of the season of the Phoenix Suns, you know, one of my friends is the forward for the Phoenix Suns, Mikael Bridges, and I interviewed them less than two weeks ago, right after they finished their eight and run and they didn't make the playoffs. And if I decide not to post the interview tomorrow or this week, if I wait another week, it then becomes like even less, you know, contextual to what people are paying attention to, which are not the Phoenix Suns. Um, and so I, I think to myself that all the time of like, how do I consistently like pump out content as quick as possible and not get caught up on what I've done, but more so like, what can I do tomorrow? You know, yeah. and all those yeses were those things of how can I extend my arm to this person? How, where do I bring value to this person? Um, and I'm also learning now is that people you do hear sometimes you can't say yes to everything. I just believe it just, you don't have to say yes in the now, maybe you could say yes later. And if you can't help them in the now, then I believe you should further extend your arm to introduce them to someone who can. Um, these people don't forget yeah. introductions and they don't forget how they meet each other. Yeah, man, that's awesome. I'm curious if you believe, you know, kind of a math equation, you know, putting yourself in as many opportunities as possible and finally getting that one, or if it's almost like the universe, like rewarding you for putting in all of this hard work and, you know, bringing value to people that you, you know, necessarily didn't have to. I don't necessarily think about that where as in if I'm doing this one right thing what will my return be I do think about or just yeah right just I, thinking back on yeah it right yeah now. I think I do think about um doing the right thing I do think about the relationships that I have and that I've cultivated and what you know led me to that like I have my reflection moments when sometimes you know my life is fast and I try to, at moments, especially on my plane rides, that when I'm going between states, I, I try to think of like, hey, what am I doing? Like, who am I about to meet to, to help? You know, like that's where I find my moments of being present um, and how you refer to just reflection, in my opinion. That's like the question really is, how, yeah. how did I get there? Like, what did I do for the universe to put me there? Um, and I think to myself, it's just really just working really hard and, and continuously showing up, right? And making sure that I do it to the best of my ability. And I also want to show because like social media and like many other uh, things or the way people talk to that, they don't have failures. I have failed. I have failed a client before. I have made people angry before. Um, I think those are all have been lessons for me of like, what did I do to trigger them? Or what did I do to not fulfill the project? I have done that. Um, I have had moments when I first started, I had my SD card inside my laptop. I stuffed my laptop inside my backpack. I go on a bike ride. This is right when I started. The SD card is bent in half and I spent the whole day shooting four different projects. Oh. All failed. I've had those moments. Like, and still to this day, yeah, I don't think the level of them are as like big because I'm very critical of what I do and how I do it due to my association of people where my level of of, I guess, messing up or having failure it needs to be small, a lot smaller than what it was four years ago. Of how can I improve that? You know, making sure I back up everything onto my external hard drive. Now I'm also doing external hard drive, double backup and online. 
So kind of creating systems and protocols that reduce my failure to then further me even more, right? And I laugh sometimes because, I don't know, man, I, with what I do, like there's millions of people that do what I do, right? And I don't think I'm special. I really don't. Like the way I do content, like still to this day, I jump on Instagram and I love and admire other creatives. And I think that's so important to support each other in the creative space because it can be competitive. And yeah, there's maybe there is an individual that you want to work with, but they already have a camera guy and that's cool. And that's fine. It doesn't mean I always joke around when someone says to me, they're like, Oh, I already have a camera guy. And I was like, the guy needs to go on vacation, you know, let him go do something for a week and let me substitute him, you know? Um, but it's just important to remember that with what I do, um, a lot of people other do, and you have to always tell yourself as a creative, like, what do I do differently? How do I make a mark on this, in this space as me being me? Um, and, and doing that over and over again. I think, I, I just really think it's a showing up part for people that makes it so hard. Like you True. just have to show yeah. up, even though it may be uncomfortable. And again, there's still projects that I show up to that I may not feel as confident in, but it's just showing up, you know, just, just show up and, and do it. Yep. Um, and, and through that, and if you're unsure, you research it or you ask friends, I still to it, still to this day, if there's something or a project that I'm uncertain by, I'll YouTube Google it. And now I'm thankful enough where there's a network of creatives where I'll reach out to and ask them questions. I'm like, Hey, I'm going into this. I've never done this before. I've seen you do it in the past. Is there any tips or something you could recommend for me to do? I still do that to, still to this day. That's awesome. Yeah. I can relate in the podcast community. It's, it's really similar, you know, it's in a way, you know, creative, but um, yeah, man, you, you just have to keep showing up, be different, be yourself. And uh, you know, if you keep doing that over and over, eventually there'll be certain people that respect and admire those qualities and you can gain traction that way. Right. Um, You've worked with so many big names and you know, these people are super successful in your career and not many people get to see them up in person, you know, especially guys like Dan Fleischman and, and seeing them work up close and personal what are some commonalities you've seen amongst all of them that, you know, kind of lead you to believe, okay, that's why these people are successful. I can, you know, look to this and this. Yeah. Uh, One thing for sure. I'm very blessed and thankful to say this. They're all good human beings um, and that they have good intentions for what they do and how they do it. Uh, I think that's like the foundational thing of who you are as a person and how do you reciprocate that to others, no matter who they are, what they've done. Um, having the conversation with that saying, my dad always tells me, you talk to the CEO and the janitor the same way. Um, and Dan does that. Every person I work with, um, they do that. There, there's not kind of that I'm too high and mighty uh, kind of vibe. I think it's just more so people at times you have to, for, you can't forget that they're humans too. And I sometimes hear people like, oh, that person was rude to me. And I said to him, you know, depending who the character is, I said to him, where did you see them? Like where, at what point did you have a moment of conversation? And they're like, yeah, he was in the middle of like 50 people asking him questions. He was trying to get into his car and, you know, he looked at me, he asked me the question and then walked away. And I said to him, it's context, you know, like they are people too. They're trying to get somewhere and maybe they can't have that answer for you in that exact moment. Or you just caught them in a moment where they were in between calls or something, you know? Um, and I think that's very important to keep in mind is that sometimes we pull people f- for their attention and maybe in that moment, that's not the right moment um, to have, you know, to get their attention or to ask a certain questions to have that present in mind. So the first thing is just being uh, kind humans. Um, the that's second great. thing I would say is they're great leaders. So they understand their role and they understand delegation, which is something I'm currently going through right now today, where yesterday even I had my virtual assistant sent out where I'm having, I'm going to hire two full-time video editors, where I've always had contracted editors, where now I'm taking that leap of faith of saying, no, these are my guys. These are the people I'm going to be using, and these are the people I'm going to grow with. And so they're great leaders, and they have a great understanding of delegation. Um, And knowing that they can't be a part of every conversation and in that, they trust someone else to then take, make that decision for them. Um, and I think that's the greatest thing. And then the third thing is that they still all work hard. 
And so that's contextual because people think what is working hard? Does it mean waking up at 5 a.m., going to bed at 3 a.m., sleeping two hours? No, it means that they're focused on the goal of what they're trying to achieve and they have certain protocols or systems in place to do that over and over again. So I don't know if you've heard the saying that money makes more money. And that's yep. just because they're having the right conversations with the right people to get done what they want to be done through their business or through their personal life. Right. And that's how you see the continuous growth of money from certain people is because they're having, they're asking the right questions to the right people and they're focused in the right places. And so they do that over and over again. And they, as you grow as an individual, your conversations grow and your money, you, you hope focused on the financial side of things. You know, I don't believe life is based on money, but I do understand that money is the currency that we need to live in this world. So you can't be ignorant to that. It's understanding that there's a, this dollar, the money that we need to pay our bills, to take care of the people we want to take care of. And there's also social currency, which are having these type of conversations, right? Like I'm yeah, on this yeah. podcast because you reached out to me. I looked into you based off what you've put out and who you promote yourself on social media is why I'm here. And I believe in this, there's no physical transaction. You're not paying me. I'm not paying you to be here. You know, it's a social currency that we have that I believe that's so valuable um, that we can ever repeat. And that's so important. And so it's three, those three qualities of just being a kind human working really hard um, that I believe has them as a leader, the, the second or third one or, or that makes them great um and they just do it over and over again and just repeat it's like rinse and repeat that's awesome those are three great qualities another thing that i'm really curious about you know getting into the power of networking a little bit deeper what would you recommend to someone starting out maybe they see the power of networking but they don't have any big connections at this point yeah how do you get started and kind of get that snowball rolling and, you know, start to develop that network of people? Yeah. Great question. Great question. So I think the first thing is being intentional with who you want to be and who do you want to surround yourself with? Um, by then you're able to make the right decisions towards where you want to go. And so uh, for me, uh, my base was the fitness facility where I knew those qualities I referred to before is like-minded individuals, people that were a players on, kind of owning businesses or knowing someone who owned a business. Um, that was my foundation of like being in that gym or being in that space. How do I, you know, cultivate my network? And it's simply just being introduced one person to another. Um, there is also, I've heard people always say like, Hey, if there's anyone that you could recommend me that can be introduced to, I've never been the type to do that. I think that naturally if someone thinks of you and that, they think of someone else that would be a good kind of like business partnership or even friendship to introduce. It'll happen organically. Um, but again, I believe that also happens with placing yourself there. And so for someone who immediate action and tips right now, um, it would be simply, you know, outline, I call it mind dumping of what you want. And if you don't know what you want, that's okay too. But I think it's just having a base of there's definitely one individual or certain cast of individuals that you see and you tell yourself, man, I want to be like that. Or, Hey, I love that quality of that person. Write that down. And then you start to under, you start to narrow your vision on where you want to go based off the characters that you're following or people that you admire to be. And so if you're saying, Hey, Roger, I'm trying to get in contact with, let's just say Grant Cardone. And I would say, great. Why? If I get you on the phone with him, why? What are you going to ask? Oh, I want to ask him how to start real estate. Did you even Google it? Did you even try, did I always say, did you try to extend your arm to the resources in front of you first before you're thinking to extend your arm to other resources that you can't reach and that you then use it as an excuse of why you can't do it? Do you see where right. I'm going here? Yeah, exactly. Like, use what's around you have, you know, ask your friend, you know, financially, one of my best friends works at a bank and he got me started with everything I can think of from investing into stocks to getting my savings account to my 401k, things that I never thought about he was one of my best friends and I didn't need to Google that. I didn't need to YouTube that. I just called him. Right. And you need to become resourceful with your resources around you. And then when you feel that there's a deficiency on that by books, you know, the, the beauty of social media is that you could follow certain characters that you want to be like, or that you admire. And that's why I said, that's one of the first things you need to do is who are those people? If it's one person, if it's 10 people, if it's 20 people, that's fine. But at least you're focused or you have your energy towards something or a person that you want to be like, 
And then it's having that constant stimulation of that. And again, you know how I refer to money breeds money or the right characters are meeting with the right people. So if, if you're documenting a, let's just say a business owner, pretty sure he has a friend who's a business owner too. I would bet so. Or if you're documenting a basketball player, I'm pretty sure he's friends with another professional basketball player. <laughs> and so that's where the network comes in of, you know, if you have that one person and it's in that association you want to be in, make sure you do a really good job at it and you over deliver. Um, that's another thing that I talk about for me as a creative where I believe I'm set to do something, but I do more. And if I'm set to do one video, I'll do one video and then do an Instagram stories. If I'm set to do one Instagram video and then I do a TikTok, I'll send them that. Or I'll take pictures and then I do custom Instagram stories that they could post. So it's like, what more can you do for them that brings them value that allows them not to forget you? And you as a creator, you as a person just looking to extend your network, you do that with your resources around you. And then if not, you start to reach out virtually, you know, Twitter and Instagram are great resources to do so. Um, I've learned more. I don't use it as frequently, but Twitter, yeah, you could immediately at someone and the chances of them seeing it are pretty high and responding to you. But just make sure the questions that you ask aren't questions that you can't Google or YouTube because there's so many people now that are using social media as a form of education and an outlet to get the questions you want answered. And if someone hasn't asked them already, they've already made a video about it or tweeted about it or made a post about it, right? And so I would say the greatest thing is just be resourceful with who's around you. And then if you feel that still isn't enough, then start to really focus in on the people or the characters that you look up to and see what they're doing um, to then further grow what, who they are and what they're doing and how they're doing it. Because again, everyone's, everyone has a voice and everyone's doing something through uh, the internet or social media to make their voice heard. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Great advice for sure. And so would you recommend then if, you know, there's someone that an individual would like to reach out to and get to know, how would you go about approaching that to stand out from everyone else who's, you know, reaching out, sending, you know, poor DMs and things like that, that, you know, this person's probably absolutely sick of, what can you do to stand out a little bit and uh, actually kind of get through to somebody and possibly make a connection or at least increase your chances? Yeah. So I would say, again, the basis is what value do you bring to them? If you're trying to reach out to an individual that has a mass following and then you're one out of a million, you can't just say, hey, what's up? Let's connect. Right. Where is the value for them in that? Where, where, where do they feel that they should respond to you? So I'm just using an example. If I'm an individual who um, is a basketball player or no, I'm going to I'm going to dumb it down even less. So if I'm an individual who's a business owner. And my business is jewelry. And you tell me as a content creator and individual, hey, I'd love to make a short video for your business. I'm going to respond, right? I'm, I'm going to yep. respond. Or again, to keep it in context of your question, uh, someone who's a high net worth individual, if I'm an actor and you then reach out to me and say, hey, there's a great uh, resource with, you know, I hear you're making this movie. Um, I'd love to introduce you to this person who's making this, who I believe could help you or further benefit you with the role that you're trying to prepare for. I think that person would respond, you know, it's more enticing to them to do so. And if you say, all right, if they don't respond, that's okay too. How do you then um, come in contact with them? Is this engaging with them in any way possible? Sometimes what I do, if I'm trying to reach out to someone through Instagram is I'll send them a message. I'll wait a day or two. If I see they still haven't read it, I'll then go to their most recent post like it and then comment at them, you know, in reference to show love to the context of what's above a video or a photo. And then I'll add, I shot you a DM, would love to talk further. So then they see it and they're able to see in the DMs, what value do I bring to them? So nine out of 10 times for me as a creator, my value is content, which can be applied to any, you know, anyone. So I say to them, depending who it is, hey, I see you're doing this, would love to shoot this type of content for you. Or I see this and would love to shoot that type of content for you right? And then they see value in it because it's something that they don't have and they would like to have if it makes sense for them. And then if not, sometimes it happens too, where the individual, you know, may not say yes, that's normal too. I always respond, no worries. I'm here if you need me. And then if anything changes in the future, feel free to reach out because you always want to have that open door. You never want doors to immediately close and be locked. You want to let them know that 
what you're telling them isn't just in the moment and that there could be a conversation in the future or you could met, meet them in a different setting. Yeah, man. No, no sense in burning bridges. <laughs> yeah, never. Yeah. So I hope that answered your question though, with kind of yeah. outreach, which is, you know, be, be of service them or bring value to them. Um, and then to start to figure out if there's not, there's not just one way. And even if they don't respond, that's okay too. I've done that where if I'm trying to get in contact with someone, I'll message them three, four, five, six times, but I'm not, I'm not copy and pasting the message. I'm bringing the message in context of today. I see them doing something and I respond to them doing it. And then I, I get, do the ask, right. It's having that mentality of, you can't just say the same thing to them and expect, expect them to say a different answer or respond if they didn't respond to other times. Right. right. <laughs> yeah, that's great, man. No, that's definitely awesome advice. So you've been podcasting. How's that going? It's good. It's been, it's been really good. So I, I filmed about, it was like 16 to 20 episodes during COVID. I was doing them through Instagram live. Uh, prior to COVID I had done, or, or sorry, during COVID I was recording them. And then I was like, Hey, I wanted to do a, a rebranding. So I've made it a focus of mine for every Tuesday and Thursday, I'm releasing an episode. And then now I think around next week, I'm going to start because I'm still, yeah. So it's about two week and then I have built out based off how many have posted. I think I still have like eight weeks built out of content. Awesome. Um, I always want to stay ahead of the game. So around probably next week, I'll start interviewing people again. I'll probably do at least, I want to do at least one or two a week. And yeah, it's been great. I think it's a great way to network. You know, I think that's why, you know, I would have never, you know, spoken to you in, in the streets or in person if I exactly you know, that's the podcast, right? Um, and I think that's a great tool. It's a great resource, which is why I love podcasting. Um, I'm not doing it for myself. I'm doing it because I'm having conversations with individuals that I admire, that I feel it would be wrong if I didn't share it with other people. Because I have those moments, you know, when I'm in a room with someone and I ask them questions, I'm like, man, this is so deep and this is so educational. And other people need to hear it. And so that's why I love podcasting where I'm able to have these conversations with people that uh, people yeah. admire and they've reached a certain level of success, let it be financially or socially. And people are curious to hear their answers on those things. So, um, and I, I just generally love, again, social currency, having conversations with people. Likewise, man. Yeah, it's great. I mean, I don't know if I would have had an excuse to uh, have a conversation with you if I didn't have this podcast. So case in yeah, point right here that's what, that's, that's what it is with me too you know there's certain people that i meet and they already have a content guy or they have a whole marketing team that's like two floors of a building why do they need me they don't but then i say to them hey i have a podcast and i would love to have you on it and i explain to them why or who i've had on the past of where that it finds to be a resource of them entrepreneurs creative marketing and I, and i'm able to get them on and then further my relationship so then if something comes from it great if not so, right, I still have that conversation with them and I benefit in somehow, which is just learning from them, right? Yeah, man, exactly. That's, that's exactly the mindset I have going into it. So I'm glad to hear you think similarly there. Um, awesome, man. This has been a, a really great conversation. I know I've learned a lot. I'm sure everybody listening has also learned a lot. What can people look forward to, uh, you know, coming from you in the coming weeks and months? Yeah, there's a couple of exciting things. I'm going to be shooting... Um, I just got booked to shoot, well, tomorrow, I was just telling you, which is pretty cool. Tomorrow I'm going to be headed with Charlie Rocket, who's another amazing individual who's constantly giving back. He was a, a producer who put uh, two chains on the map. Um, yeah, yeah, in, man. In the world, and then he later transitioned to the motivational speaking space um, because I believe it was he had a tumor um, because he was overweight, he changed his life completely, ends up being in a Nike commercial, manifesting all these different things. And now he's on a mission just to give back. And he's going to be going tomorrow on the impulsive show with Logan Paul. And I'm going to be shooting the behind the scenes for that. So that's going to be cool. I'm also working on a project for Spartan. So they're an obstacle course company that travels around the, I believe globe, but more so the country that yeah, I'm man. familiar with. They're launching their own app and I'm going to be shooting with a friend of mine, all the content to build out their app. So it's about four to eight trainers and uh, they're going to be leading people through various exercises. So they're, I'm going to be building out that. And I think that's it for now. Things that I could publicly <laughs> share. Uh, but uh, yeah, this, you know, the content game is ever, ever going. It, it's, it never stops. And that's what I love about it. And so, you know, the, it's just, just going on to the next thing and doing whatever is needed. But I just want to say thank you so much for having me on, man. This has been awesome. Uh, not only just 
talking about my journey and having that reflection because when I have these conversations, I sometimes forget, you know, what, where I've been and what I've yeah. done, just the constant motion. But I'd say the greatest thing is for me being able to share the stories uh, not the highlights, but again, uh, the lessons, right? Because I'm still learning. I'm not perfect at what I do. I, I truly believe in that. Every day is a day of growth and every day is a, is a lesson. But the people listening to really hone down and think about what am I doing? You know, what am I doing? Who am I doing it with? How do I want to be known? Uh, those are three questions that I say to ask yourself on that. And, you know, really just think of how can you further uh, what you want to do, uh, let it be socially, let it be financially, or let it be personally. Um, so thank you so much for having me on, man. This is awesome. I'm glad that we we're able to connect and I'm glad that you used your podcast as a form for us to connect. And, you know, now we're in touch. So, you know, feel free to, aside from the, and also the people listening, you know, you could follow me on social media outlets. Roger M. Rojas is the straight across everything um, with any questions or anything. And always the same thing goes to, to you, man. If, course if there's appreciate it what they introduce you to just just reach out and i'll do the best i can hey thanks so much man i appreciate it and uh the pleasure is all mine it's been a great conversation and uh everybody go check him out give him a follow i know he's modest about his content skills but i think he's next level and i think there's a a great reason why all these awesome people trust him to produce their work so appreciate that thanks so much man Thank you.